really exciting. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I think what I appreciated most about it is that, um, you know, as, as an aspiring magazine journalist and uni student that I, like so many young women, kind of looked up to you as, um, you know, this amazing glossy figurehead. You know, you were editor of Cosmo by the time you were 24, which is a, a huge achievement. Um, I suppose you, you set the bar a bit high for all of us in terms of being, um, you know, the supergirl of the magazine scene. But what essentially what you've done with the book is um, brought home the fact that it's not all glossy appearances. Um, everything is not as it seems, that glossy editors have lives outside um, of the glossy pages of their magazines. Um, mm. is, is that something that was really important to you, to kind of demystify the role of the editor? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think that, um, you know, like anyone, I read stories about people who are in the public eye and who, who I admire and I think, wow, their, their lives look so together and my life is so hopeless by comparison and I still think that um, but nobody's life is like that nobody's life is like the glossy page of a magazine and I think that it's you know beholden on women in the public eye to be a little bit more honest in many cases about the struggles that we have and the failures that we experience and the inadequacies that we feel and it's 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 a common thing it doesn't matter how glamorous your job looks uh, you scratch the surface and there's always stuff going on underneath that. And and that's something that wasn't appropriate for me to write about at the time when I was at Cosmo. But, you know, years down the track, looking back with perspective and, um, you know, now it, it, working for myself, I, there are a lot of things that I was ready to talk about and that I was ready to, to, to share with everybody. Yeah, a lot of the, um, the content's really confrontational. It's honest, it's raw, it's moving, it's um, kind of paralyzing. Some of it you talk about um, a, a terrible relationship that you had, a really destructive relationship, your miscarriage, mm. um, the torture of being ensconced at Channel 9 in the boys' club. Um, you know, the, there are all these really trying times in your life, and yet as the editor, you kind of had to pull yourself together. How do you do that? Oh, totally. And, you know, because I guess there were some good times, there's many good times as well, you know. There was there was a lot of what helped me through that was the strength and the support of my staff and of my girlfriends. Um, you know, through all of that time, that was the big constant and a lot of people sort of talk about women's magazines and, oh, isn't it full of bitches and so superficial and blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, my experience, I guess as an editor, you're fortunate enough to be able to create the culture of your magazine. And I had always um, been very influenced by editors like Pat Ingram and Lisa Wilkinson in particular, who I worked with at Clio and who gave me my break as work experience. And they were always very, very nurturing of me and of other women around them. And I, I wanted to carry that on and, and I really enjoyed having working with women. I loved it. I loved the energy of... of supporting women and being supported by women. Fifteen years ago, it was kind of the heyday at ACP magazines, obviously. The mm. Packer family, um, you know, they had more than just a, a financial interest in seeing that the magazines were as successful as possible. So what was the, the vibe like at ACP then? Was it was it kind of fun and um, or competitive? Yeah, it was a bit of all of that. You know, there was a great um, a sort of a pride and a mythology about the time. It was sort of like the Camelot of magazine, the magazine industry, the days of the Packers. And, you know, I, I never um, had any direct dealings with them and they never, you know, all the sort of mythology of them picking up the phone and barking orders. I never saw that. It never happened to me. I don't know if it actually even ever happened. Maybe it did, but... It was still, the fact that it could happen or that it might happen was still really quite exciting. You know, we all had these, we call them bat phones, all the editors and all the people in senior management, these kind of funny yellow phones on our desk and that was called the bat phone and it was a direct line that all editors could call each other but also that Kerry um, could call all the editors directly, didn't have to go through secretaries or anything and so when your bat phone rang, you ran for it, well, either towards it or away from it depending on whether you were in trouble or not. Um, but, you know, I think one time I picked up the phone and it was Kerry and um, he put down the phone and I could see that it was him that had called and 
freaked out and I called back his secretary and she's like, oh, don't worry, you just must have called you by mistake. And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God. So, you know, it was – there was that side of it. And there was also just the fact that magazines were in their prime as far as Cos- – particularly Cosmo and Cleo, which were the mags I was working on. And in the days of Lisa um, editing Cleo and Pat editing Cosmo – and sales were like through the roof and every month who could outdo each other with something more, you know, um, crazy and, and more cheeky and more outrageous. And there was if things – you could get away with a lot more then than you could now, you know. It's, it's a lot stricter. Everything has to be sealed and you kind of avoid certain words on the cover. And back then it was kind of – you know, we did some crazy things like scratch off. We did a – you know, like lottery tickets, we once did a thing of scratch off Arnie. Uh, there was a photo of Arnold Schwarzenegger in the nude. And um, at Cleo, we did this thing, scratch off Arnie's undies. But the paper stock was kind of too thin. And when you scratched off the thing, you scratched right the way through the page. So you scratched a big hole in Arnie. Um, but just, you know, crazy things like that. And I remember Cosmo did an excerpt of Madonna's sex book. And... You know, we did we did mad things, and it was an exciting, fun time to be part of magazines, definitely. The whole body image thing is a passion that you've continued on now. Um, lots of your blog posts refer to it. Um, you're not mm. a fan of Photoshopping, um, and you're also sitting on the, the body image advisory board. Um, where's that at now? That's been just the most fantastic experience. You know, um, I've been uh, so lucky to be part of that, and... Um, some of the people that, that I've met through that, you know, one of whom is Sarah Cornish, the editor of Girlfriend, who I think are doing fantastic things with, with Body Image, with their magazine, and I think kind of leading the way, really, from what I can see. Um, so one of the things that I've been most involved with is doing this, um, compiling this um, voluntary media code of conduct for the portrayal of women, basically. Um, and uh, Sarah's also been quite instrumental in, in working on that. And, and we've used a lot of the sort of unofficial um, aspects of, of girlfriends' policies that they use behind the scenes um, for the way that they treat the portrayal of women. So that's been a fascinating exercise and, and mixing with community leaders and um, healthcare professionals and people who are at the forefront of eating disorders and people from the fashion industry. It's you know, been a fabulous process. I really, really am optimistic and hopeful that that, that it will be embraced. Okay. On that note, thank you so much. Um, happy blogging, and I hope the book does really well. Thanks, Thanks for having me.